in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Amen? You see, those guys knew what our nation was built on. All right? They were willing to raise their hands and, and go die for their country, to go serve and possibly give their lives for our country because of the foundations of our country. Now, we might have started out a little bit shaky, maybe a little squirrely, made some mistakes with some things as a country, but still, our country was founded on the principles of God. Amen? It was the foundation of the lives of the men and women that gave themselves for our freedom. Amen? So, so along the way, we, we, we make some mistakes and we, we try to fix things as we go. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. Amen? Jesus has called us to do the same thing as each and every one of those that gave their physical lives. He's called us to give our lives for even a greater battle than World War II, than Vietnam, than World War I, than any of those wars. We're in the biggest battle of our life right now, right here in this place. Can I get an amen? So we should also be willing to give our lives, even though we don't have to give our physical lives, you never know, somebody might have to pay that cost someday. But even though we don't have to do that, we have to give our life in Christ to people that need it so desperately. You see, we're fighting a different battle than what was fought in those times, but it's even a bigger battle. The enemy wants more casualties in this battle than any of the other battles combined before. He wants more wounded warriors as any of these other wars before. He wants more broken homes and broken families because of death, only it's a different type of death. It's spiritual death that's happening in our country right now. Can I get an amen? He wants us to fight against spiritual death in our country. You see, there's been a spiritual decline in America. It's been crazy over the last five years, hasn't it? You know, we always talk about it because we have to, because we have to become that radical church that wants to fight against the enemy that is taking ground on a daily basis. It, it seems like day to day there's something new each and every day that comes up against the people of God and this great country. Amen? You see, America used to send out missionaries to all kinds of countries, because we had it together. We were a Christian nation, and we would send missionaries out. And some of you have gone out in the field, and some of you might still someday. But right now, America is like the biggest mission ground in the world. America needs Jesus Christ. Amen. America needs to stand up and serve the radical Jesus that he was. Jesus was a radical and he, and he served, he, he came to serve, and he served in a radical time, just like this time. And he taught us how to do that. And the church has to do it, amen? And we're all about defeating Satan's kingdom, right? Y'all want to beat Satan's kingdom? Some of you aren't quite so sure. Okay, he's raising up some warriors in this place. When I was in boot camp, we had to march and we had to stay in step and we sang these songs as we marched, but I only hear one or two amens here. Are you ready to fight a battle? Are you ready to march together? Are you ready to take over the kingdom of God? Are you ready to do all those things? Because that's why we're here. I don't want to be here if that's not why we're here. Okay? I can shrink back anywhere in this whole world. I don't want to shrink back in the church. Amen? A lot of people think nobody else cares, so they don't care themselves. A lot of people think the battle's too big, that it can't be won with just a few. 
But I'm telling you, we got Jesus on our side. Jesus wants to see America saved. He wants to see people saved, amen? I don't know where this country is going. We are in the end times. We don't know what's going on, but I do know this. Jesus wants some people saved. He wants some lives changed. He wants to go ahead and harvest the fields, and that's what we're here to do this day and this age, amen? Regardless of what we think about other people and whether they're willing to serve alongside of us, he's called you and he's called me, amen? It has to start with somebody, right? Somebody, anybody, amen? Anybody, are you a somebody in this place? God wants to do something with somebody in this place. Can I get an amen? God wants to raise up some somebodies that are willing to go out and do the work that he's called us to. David said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Then he says, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Today we have the opportunity to choose. You woke up this morning with an opportunity to make this the, the Lord's day and to make it a different day from every other day. Can I get an amen? Here's the awesome thing about the God we serve. We get new mercies every single morning. We can operate in new grace every single day. That's what I love about our God. He loves us. He cares for us. And each and every day, he wants us to take another step of faith. Even if we went backwards five steps the day before, he wants you to leap forward because he loves you so much. Who you were yesterday doesn't have to be who you are today, okay? Who you, what you did yesterday is not what you have to do today. Can I get an amen? I can be greater today than I was yesterday. And if we're going to be a radical army ready to do this, then each and every day is a new day. It is the Lord's day, amen? But we often view life from an ordinary mindset. Sometimes we view ourselves as ordinary and we limit God. We limit so many Christians these days. And I throw that word around lightly because there's so many that say they are in this country, but they need to be evangelized. They need to be saved. Amen. God says if we're going to be saved, we repent. If you don't repent, then I question whether you were ever really saved. Yes, we're going to mess up. Yes, we can depend on the grace of God. Yes, we can trip up, but we repent and we run back to God. Amen. So if you never do that, were you ever really saved? And it becomes ordinary for us. We go through the same motions every day. And we start to be who society says that we are. Society wants to put a label on each and every one of you. Society wants you to be exactly what they want you to be. And God has called you to greater things. He set you apart from society. You are not a part of society. You are not a part of this culture. Can I get an amen? Does anybody believe it or am I preaching? All right. Do you, have you seen too much? Amen. Don't tell me you weren't born to be great. You're a child of God. Amen. God created you to be great. It doesn't matter your stature. It doesn't matter your size. It doesn't matter your thing. It doesn't matter your grades in school. None of that stuff matters. God created you to be great, and he gave you gifts so that you can be radically saved and serve his purpose, his kingdom in Jesus' name. This is not our home. I was just playing baseball. The other day, I was talking to a young man yesterday. His game got rain, rained out, and I said, you know what? It's been like 45, 50 years since I played baseball like that, but I can still remember the disappointment that I had when my game got rained out. And I told him, I said, you know, there could be six inches of water on the field, and I'd be like, we can play. It's okay. It's safe. We can play. That's how much I wanted to play baseball. Now here I am. Look at me now gray hair, it flies by fast. 
It goes by so fast. And, you know, we talked this weekend about end times, and we talked about the rapture, and we could be the, on the verge of the rapture any time now. We have to be prepared. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to allow God to prepare us. Amen? Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant beyond all that we ask and imagine. You see, we should wake up every single day and say, God, this is not just another day. I want you to do something great in my life today. When I, when I get out of this bed, when I take my shot, when I get up, I want you to do something amazing in my life today. I want you to blow my expectations out of the water. Yes, I have expectations, but that's that verse said that he can do exceedingly above your expectations. And sometimes some of you set your expectations too low. I told Don today, I hope you're prepared for an encounter. He said, I came expecting. I said, praise the Lord. If you came expecting, you shall get that encounter. Amen. God, do what my faith can't even imagine. Blow my faith out of, the, out of the water, Lord. Amen. Can you say that to God? Or does it scare you? It scares some people. Oh, it might take too much. It might cost too much. Okay, can you really get before God and say, God, do that in my life today. Can you allow God to, to be God today? You see, that's what God wants to do in our lives. We just have to allow him to do that, do those things, and sometimes get out of his way. Amen? Our favorite verse here is Romans 12, 2, and it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we have to do that daily. And I keep repeating that for three years. I've been repeating that verse. But it's something that we have to repeat daily. Amen. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we're responsible to do that. Amen. You're responsible for your own mind. Amen? If your mind is struggling, if you have confusion, if you have a spirit that wants to come on you and bring confusion, cast that spirit out. It's as simple as saying, I rebuke you, I cast you out in Jesus' name and transform your thinking. I started to get sick this week. And I, that happens a lot. I'm, no, this ain't happening. I rebuke this sickness in Jesus' name. I don't care about these symptoms that I just experienced, and I walk out of that sickness. You have to continue to do those things. You have to see past the stretch, past the difficulties, the things that God wants to do in your life. Sometimes we picture them as, as too much change, too much stress in our lives, too many difficulties that we'll have to deal with. There's too many impossibilities along the way. Can I get an amen? How many here have given up because of impossibilities? I did it. But I'll tell you, there's been times when I didn't. And, and even when I shouldn't have made it, I made it. Even when it was impossible, it worked. Even when everybody said it couldn't happen, it happened. That's the way God does it. That's how he works in your life. He continues to add that to your life. And the impossibilities get smaller and smaller. What about the excuses? Oh, I can't do it because, yeah, we got more excuses sometimes than Jimmy Carter had liver pills. Is that what they used to say back in the day? I'm still trying to figure out what a liver pill is. But Jimmy Carter had a lot of them, obviously, because my grandmother used to tell me that all the time. Jimmy Carter's got a lot of liver pills, amen? We have to see past all of that. We have to see what God sees. God sees something amazing in your life, and we have to be able to see that same thing. God has a great vision. He has, he has an end here and an end here, and an end. it's a continual milestones along the way. He has those steps. We have to see each one of them, but we fail to see them sometimes. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, 
giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Okay, and these are the times that we're living in now. Amen? These demons are stirring up the flesh all across this world. All across this country, all across this community, demons are stirring up the flesh. Amen? They're sent to cause distress. They're sent to create strongholds. They're sent to control how people think. Okay? They want to control your thoughts. We talked about this last week. They, they want you to move upon those thoughts. That's the doctrine of demons. They want to control what you think. Battle against the faith. That's what Satan hates the most. And that's why we see what we see today. He hates the faith. He hates the love of God. He hates the victory of God in somebody's life. He hates to see people moving forward in Christ. He wants to call you back. He wants to put you down. He wants to cause you to stumble. He wants to, to give you strongholds and bitterness and, and all of those things. He wants to distract you and cause restlessness and trouble in your life. They want to harass you, these buffeting spirits. They want to harass you and suppress you. They confuse anything to keep you from the word of God and doing what it says. Amen? Amen. How am I doing with time? We always use the phrase, we are the Nehemiahs in this house, hence we're the builders, amen? We are the Nehemiahs. You see, Nehemiah was in captivity. I'm going to give you the 30 second. Nehemiah was in captivity, and somebody came to him and told him about his people, and he went to his knees, his people that were, that were in Jerusalem, the walls were burnt down. You know, there was trouble there. They had escaped. Most of the Jews were in captivity. And Nehemiah heard about this, and he went to the Lord all of his, on his own. And he got permission from that king of Babylon. He got permission from that king to go ahead and go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And, and they've been sitting there for 75 years. And in 52 days, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. Along the way, he had a lot of buffeting spirits that came against him, a lot of vexing spirits, a lot of people that came against what God wanted to do with Jerusalem. Amen. But they stood there with builders and with preachers and sons and daughters and families and they put their hands to the plow and they changed Israel, Jerusalem forever and they built the wall in 52 days and I believe that he's called the way center out to help to rebuild this wall and even if we have to lead the charge, even if we have to step out as Nehemiah did and do it that way, we will do it. Amen, we're called to do that. All it took was his one decision. You know, I, I wonder if nobody told Nehemiah about the condition of Jerusalem if he would have lived out the rest of his days in captivity being the king's cupbearer, if that's what he would have done. But he made a decision, and all it took was one day. So it doesn't matter what you're up against in your life. Your decision could change your life, and all it takes is a split-second decision to change it. All it takes is one day, and you can supersede everything that the enemy wants to do in your life that day and from this day forward. It says in Nehemiah 1, the words of Nehemiah, my daughter read this in our revival services, the son of Hachaliah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan and the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress. They're in reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. 
And it sounds a lot like our country right now. Things are broken down. Walls have been taken down to the ground. Okay, protection is not there like it used to be because we've allowed the walls to come down. Things are burned up. It's distressing what, what we see to us. And, and even though we've been called to change it, some of us have never bothered to even take the step to be a part of that change. Amen? Why? Because it's too hard. Because it's just me. What can I do? But it's time for, you know what, we each and every one of us, we have children and grandchildren that are watching. We have a legacy to leave behind. We have to be the Nehemiahs for our children. If the Lord tarries beyond what, we, what I think, we have to be that legacy lever. We have to be the Nehemiahs for our children and grandchildren. Can I get an Amen. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and I was praying before the God of heaven. You see, our burden has to move us like it, like it moved Nehemiah. Amen. We have to be able to sit and weep before the Lord for what we see. Not just be angry about it, but actually weep before the Lord to mourn what has happened in our country and to give it to God, to go to him in fasting and prayer and take it to his consideration to change it. And it said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants. And sometimes we give up. You see, he went and prayed day and night. He says, I prayed day and night. I, I heard Norval Hayes talking about a woman that he knew that went and adopted this young child that was deformed in its feet and it was expected to never walk. And he tells about the woman that, that God called her to adopt that baby, that, that, that young man. He was, a, he was actually a, a probably... 10 or 12 years old by the story, and, and she took that boy into her home, and each and every day in the morning, she would stand at the foot of the bed before that boy got out and got into his wheelchair, and she would declare, in the name of Jesus, God, just let him walk. In the name of Jesus, I command you to get up and walk. In the name of Jesus, day in and day out, the same thing. I command you to get up and walk. In Jesus' name, she never, got, she never gave up. And then every night she would tuck that boy into bed and she would get down on her knees and she would say, Lord, just change this boy. Lord, make, make this boy whole. Just change him and make him whole, God, in Jesus' name. Move in this boy, Lord. For three years she would, she would declare in the morning and she would pray in the evening. And after three years she was, she was in bed with her husband one night and she heard a noise out in the living room. And she said to her husband, uh, it, it, did you leave the TV on in there? See, they had TVs then. Did you leave the TV on in there? He said, no, I shut the TV down. She said, well, I hear a noise. He said, no, it can't be. I turned the TV off. I'm her, sure. And she, she sat up and, and she said, I, I, can't, I can't help it. I hear a noise. She said, it sounds like a piano. And she went out into that living room and there was that boy. He had walked from his bed. He went to the piano and he was playing the piano like Liberace plays the piano. Amen. She never gave up. It took three years. It took three years of praying. It took three years of fasting. It took three years of declaring, but she never gave up. That night when she went to bed, God hopped in the bed of that child that night and did something radical in that child's life. Amen? And God's going to hop in. The, yes, if, if the child has a praying mother and father, amen? If the child has somebody that will declare over him, if the child will have somebody that will pray over him, yes, God will jump in the bed of that child. Amen? It says, and confess the sins of the children. I'm back to Nehemiah. Confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have, been, which have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. I remember when we went into COVID, 
Or I remember the towers when they came down. You know, every time we had a disaster and America needed God, we would go to Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And and move from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Amen. We always forget that. They open the stores up. We don't have to wear a mask there anymore. They always forget that. It's time for the church to really get to that, to, to repent from their sins. If we really want to change, you see, Nehemiah is showing us how he did it, how he got the favor of the Lord. He was in captivity. He would have never been able to go there, but he dropped to his knees, and he got the favor of the Lord. And be, because of that, he was able to move to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. We have to do it with a repentant heart. We have to repent, folks, daily. You have to repent daily, amen, for what we do. We have, to, we, we have to go on behalf of our brothers and sisters and even repent for our nation if we want to see our nation change. We have to repent for our communities, amen, if we want to see our communities changed. Lord, I repent for that church downtown Lord, that wants to bring in those tr transsexual spiritual leaders, Pentecostal. I repent for that, Lord. I repent that we even allow it in this area, God, in the name of Jesus. I repent for that. But, God, they think it's too easy here. They come here because it's too easy, because it's good ground here. We've had the Wiccans open up in this area. We've had, we, we have a satanic church opening up in West Elmira because the devil thinks this is good ground here. Why? Because it always has been. There's never been a radical Christian that would stand up and make the changes in this place. You know, if we're radical, next week we'll go down to Wisner Park, and we'll have our church service there, protecting our community, protecting our children from that. You see, it's not about the people. It's about the evil. The people are victims of the evil. We love the people. We, we hate the evil, amen? We're not judging because we come against the sin. Jesus told us to go ahead and judge the sin. Beware of the sin, but don't judge the sinner. Amen? Amen. You know, the church down there says protecting social justice for, since 1846. I don't know if I quoted the, the year right, but we're not into social justice. That's exactly what people want. We're not into social justice. We're about kingdom justice. Amen? We're about what Jesus wants in this world. We're about that. Amen? We're about our children so that they can grow up knowing who they are, knowing how they were created, not being confused about what they're supposed to be or where they're supposed to go. We are kingdom-driven people, not social-driven people. Amen? We can't be social-driven people. We have to be kingdom people. And you are not a bigot because you're a kingdom person. Amen? You are not a bigot. Hallelujah. You might be saving lives. I, you will be saving lives. Preaching the word. The word is the only thing that's going to transform these lives now. It's the only thing. It's the only hope is the word. It's the only thing that's going to transform all of this demonic interference we see in this area as Christians that will be radical, that will speak the word and speak the truth. Confessing our sins and not just our neighbor's sins. One of the things that we tend to do is look at our neighbor's sins and forget about our own. Or how about this? Sin is a sin until somebody in your family is tripped up with this sin, and now it's not a sin anymore. You're going to justify it and think God says it's okay because it happened in my family. How about that? That's the enemy's biggest trap is his biggest lie. It's what's taking people down. There's so much of that sin, but now it's in my family. You know what? I have it in my family too, and I pray about it and pray about it, but it's not going to change the what I say about sin. It's not going to change because the only 
way that that sin can be changed and driven out is through the blood of Jesus and the true word of God. And if we don't speak it, then we condone it. And that's what's happened in America is we've condoned it because it happened to somebody close to us that we love. So we tolerate it. It's not sin anymore. That's why America is a sinful country right now. Does anybody even fear the Lord anymore? Does anybody fear the Lord? I had an old friend. We stopped being friends because we didn't see eye to eye on some things. And this friend demonized me for a few years came against me, talked poorly of me. Um, this friend's wife got sick. Just before she passed away, he called me and he said, I want to apologize. After three years, I want to apologize for the things that I did. I'm just an imperfect human. So I'm apologizing, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And I said, I've already forgiven you. I extended my hand out several times before that phone call. I've already forgiven you. Is there anything that I can do for you, I said. No. Within, I think it was a desperate plea, but within two days, his wife passed away. And before the funeral... He started to demonize me again. He went before a live audience and started to criticize, demonize me, blame me for an hour or so. For an hour or so. You see, that in itself shows that even, even if a pastor has no fear of the Lord, what do the people that's, that, that live in this country, do they have fear of the Lord? It's about time for us as Christians to get the fear of the Lord in our lives again. Yeah, you don't have to fear him like that if you're walking with him. But, but man, I got some fears in my life for him. He keeps me straight. I told, I told you guys before, I told him, if I ever turn away from you again, Lord, because I've turned away, if I ever turn away from you again, you take every single thing I have, just like Lot. That fear keeps me. That fear keeps my eyes on him. It keeps my eyes on his covenant. It keeps my eyes on his promise. Amen. It keeps my eyes on his grace. I got to have the fear of the Lord to accept his grace. Amen. I have to drive out pride with the fear of the Lord. Amen. That's what America needs to do again is drive out that pride with the fear of the Lord. Drive out that offense with the fear of the Lord. Jesus is waiting on his church today. Memorial Day. I wish there was more of you here, but apparently a lot of you took the day off. <laughs> but it's okay. I know you can watch this on live stream. But the ones that are important to be here are here today. And I praise God for that. Amen. Jesus is waiting on his church to return to him to keep his commandments, amen? The, the eyes of God are roaming back and forth across the earth. The Bible says that. He's roaming with his eyes back and forth across the, the, the earth, trying to find somebody or some church that will believe in him, that will trust in him, and that will stand on the word of God, amen, that will stand and stand strong on the word of God. And that's what Memorial Day is all about. Those soldiers, they, they stood strong. Yes, they stood on the morals. They stood on their, their, their raising their right hand to the commander in chief. They stood strong on their beliefs, but they stood strong. It says, 
Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And that word right there indicates that there's going to be a fight. Okay? He wouldn't say to, to stand against the evil one if there wasn't going to be a fight. He knows there's going to be a fight. And sometimes that's what standing means, is to get ready for the fight, to posture yourself for the fight. Amen? To take authority over, over the evil one that isn't standing. We must not be frightened. We must not slouch and, and be lazy. And, and that, that's why the Lord's eyes roams back and forth because many of the churches have been lazy. Am I boring you all? Hallelujah. Are you getting lazy with your thinking and your thoughts right now? I know you're not. I'm just picking. For those of you that are, that was your wake-up call. Amen? We can't be uncertain or half-hearted anymore. That's been the church. The, the eyes of the Lord are wandering across the earth. We have to quit accepting evil. We have to quit. We have to stop tolerating the evil. Amen? We can't give in. We don't give in. We're Christians. We're radical. We don't give in. And we don't quit. Amen? It says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Before anything, he says, put on truth. He's going to tell us there what we need to do with our weapons of our warfare, warfare and what we need to put on that day to protect ourselves from the even, evil one. And the first thing he says is you've got you to gird your waist with truth. Amen? You got to gird your waist with truth. You got to put the belt of truth on. And that's been a problem. A lot of people think that we shouldn't be putting the belt of truth on because it's against social justice, because it judges people, because it does the things that this world wants to come against. We can't afford to not put that belt of truth on. That's where every other weapon is attached to is that belt of truth. <laughs> Paul wrote this. As he watched a Roman soldier, maybe even chained to him, putting on his armor of God. He watched him put his belt on first. And every other piece of armor is about that belt of truth. That's the first thing we got to have is that truth. We have to put on truth. We have to wear it every day or we'll live a lie. There's so many people that say they're Christians, folks. And I'm just trying to appeal, you, appeal with you. So many people that say they're Christians but they're not wearing the belt of truth. They're believing a lie. They're believing the lie of the enemy. They'll believe it about sin. They'll believe it about good people. They'll believe it about judging. They'll believe whatever the world has to say to them. They'll believe it, but that's the word of the, of the world is not the word of God. The word of the world wants to trip you up. The word of God wants to prop you up. Amen? Amen. When we put on the belt of truth, we know who we are. I know who I am in Christ. I know who I am. I told my son the other day, because we are getting a reputation of radical. I told him the other day, I, I can't wait for the persecution. And when I, if we're persecuted against, we know we're speaking the truth. Amen. We know we're where God wants us to be. Amen. If nobody's bothering us, if people don't criticize us, then what good are we to the kingdom? Amen. We are, we are not ordinary people. Amen. We know who we are and we know what we believe. We aren't perfect, but we stand for the one who is. Amen. We stand for Jesus. We sang a song. I pledge allegiance to Jesus. To Jesus. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. I pledge allegiance to Jesus. To Jesus. You know what? Our children need to see us doing that. Okay? Our co-workers need to see, I pledge allegiance to Jesus. To Jesus. To the Lamb. To the Lamb of God. I pledge allegiance. We honor him. We do the right thing for the right reasons, okay? We no, we no longer get tripped up daily by the world because we're transforming our mind. 
If we get a skin knee or a bruise, we get back up and we get back on our feet and we stand again, amen? We stand there for again. That's the power of Christ working in our lives. That's the power that he's placed, the Holy Spirit in your life. So it's time for us to embrace that power and stand there for. We'll never see another ordinary day again. That saddens a lot of people. We will never see another ordinary day. We don't know what will happen. End times are God's times. Okay? He wrote the script for this. We wrote the script till now. But he's writing the script now. Okay? End times are his times. And I'll, I don't know about you. I, I am a positive person. I am not a pessimist. I am the biggest optimist. I've been, I've been criticized for being an optimist. I believe I can do anything that God told me to do. Amen. I've been criticized for it over and over and over again. But guess what? Because of that, most of the time, I get my way because that's what he said to do. But I'm an optimist. But as far as this world is concerned right now, I don't see many ordinary days left, okay? America has gone to a tipping point. I don't know, I don't know if it'll be fixed. I don't know if it's in God's plan to fix it. I know it's in his plan to have revival. And I'm saying, I'm believing we're going to have revival. I'm not saying God isn't going to, fix a miracle, but I don't know where this goes. If God doesn't intervene, a miracle will never be fixed, okay? It's way beyond the tipping point. So only God can change that now. But in the meantime, he wants some people, young people like you guys, to stand up, to pledge allegiance to the Lord, to pledge allegiance to Jesus, amen? To be kingdom-minded, Regardless of the cross, uh, cost. See how one word can change everything? <laughs> one word. The enemy can twist God's word by one single word. And he wants to twist your minds. I think I heard something about that this morning. Twisted minds. He wants your twisted thinking. The enemy wants your twisted thinking. It's time to say enough's enough. Glad you got your hat, Jeremy. Looks good on you. Amen. You wear it well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think you got the last one, didn't you? No, there's a couple more back there. As the day of awakening draws near, we have to do the same to Jesus. We have to awaken and get closer to Jesus. We have to draw near to Jesus as that day of awakening comes in. Amen. Some of us, we have to get the shovel out. We have to get the shovel out. And we have to start digging. We have to dig and dig for Jesus. Amen? We, we have to dig with Jesus. With Jesus. Not on our own. With Jesus. Amen? Dig. There's something worth digging for. Something worth digging for. And it's time for us to do that. Amen? Stand to your feet. You know, the, the word says, hearing comes, or so hopped up I can't remember the verse. Comes by the hearing of the Lord. And the word, word, faith, comes by, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. Get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Get in the word. Amen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. Speak the word of the Lord over your life. Amen. You could, you could not believe a scripture. You could not believe that Jesus called us to cast out demons. You could not believe that. But if you say it enough, if you declare it enough what Jesus said, remember, he said it. 
I'm talking about healing too. He said it. If you declare those scriptures, if you'll speak them, then pretty soon you'll be looking for those demons. You'll go on a hunt for those demons. Amen. Pretty soon you'll be walking in some healings. Amen. But you just keep speaking it. You keep speaking it. You keep hearing it. You keep speaking it. Quit hearing the words of the enemy. Quit hearing all that garbage. Start speaking the truth. Start hearing the truth. Put yourself in the middle of the Word of God daily. That's how you transform your thinking. Amen? So say this with me. No fear here. I have the Holy Ghost. I was created for this time. I know exactly what to do, and I know how to do it. I'm not afraid. I'm not lost. I'm not confused. I'm God-led, and I'm God-driven. If you mean it, give the Lord a hand clap. If you believe it, give the Lord a hand clap. You're God-led and you're God-driven. You're radical. It's okay. Don't let the world fool you. It's okay to be radical for Jesus. We need radical. If you're in this house today and you've been a long way from God, you haven't given God the time of day, or maybe you've never even given your life to Christ or even contemplated giving your life to Christ. Today, Memorial Day, a day that people died, I'm sorry, tomorrow's, but we're celebrating in this church, people died for freedom, okay? Christ wants you free today. He wants you free today. There's many people that would walk out. I'll tell you, I used to drive a boat in the Navy. I was on a big, long ship about twice as long as this church, and the, sh the ship would ballast down in the water, and we had these boats. They're called assault boats, okay? And I was a driver of the boat. We'd fill these boats up because we carried Marines, jarheads. Yeah. We carried them, and we would drive into the shore, and we would drop those jarheads off, and then we would back straight out, and we'd go back to the boat, and we'd get more. We're never guaranteed how many hours or days we have left in our lives. We're never guaranteed. Somebody I know killed in a motorcycle accident two days ago. We don't know. These Marines, we would drop them off, and I remember during World War II, their average lifespan after we dropped them on the beach was 11 seconds. They had 11 seconds to fire off as many rounds as they could, and that was their average lifespan on D-Day, that day in Normandy. We don't know what's happening with our lifespan. We think we're smart sometimes, but God, God is God. We're human. We make mistakes. I would hate to see somebody not give their life to Christ before they made the decision to do that. I would, I would rather see people give their lives to Christ. That's why we're here. And not walk out of here and it end up being the biggest mistake of their life. Heaven is real and hell is real. There's nothing that you can tell me that's any different. I've seen too much. I've seen it. And I believe it. And every word that we've read in this book has come to pass. We're sitting in the middle of God's end times right now, and we know the word. So let's not be like those people that wandered through the desert for 40 years before they got into their promised land. Some of them never saw the promised land. So if you're in this house today and, and you just want to make a decision to live for Christ, then I want to give you that opportunity. And there's no shame here. Who's made that decision in their life already once? Okay. It's a lot of people that think once you're saved, you're always saved. A lot of people think that that's, if I say something different, I'm a false teacher. But the word says to repent. Okay, 
The word says to get right and stay right with God. It teaches us that over and over again. So if you, if you just say the words and you don't repent, you were never saved. Okay? I want you to know that. You were never saved. So if that's you, if you want to give your life to Christ today and you want to make it real this time, I want you to just stick your hand up. We had a lot of hands that went up. People said they were saved. Is there anybody? There's one back there. Praise God. Anybody else? <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody else? All right. Listen, if you did, if you raised your hand, I want you to come right down here. You can go right on the back and, and come right down here to this gentleman standing by this door, okay? Be brave and come on down here now. Jesus. We're going we're gonna to sing this song and we're going to let you go. I hope this message today, this Freedom Day, or celebrating those that died, I hope this is, lights a fire inside of you. Church on fire. Church on fire, amen? Church on fire, hallelujah.